These are your significance test notes too. Today we're gonna to talk about something called significance testing. And we're first gonna start off by looking at a confidence interval, which we just got done talking about. I'd ask you to read example 10.9 on page 560, a problem involving colas and sweeteners and that type of thing, and you were asked to construct a 95% confidence interval based on sigma equaling one. That means, hopefully, you remember that'd be a one sample z interval because we know what sigma is equal to. So the idea was to use this formula right here. In your data, you would plug in those 10 different cola sweetness values into your calculator for list one, for example. Do one of our stats, you should get a mean of 1.02, mean sweetness loss. 95% confidence means we're talking about 1.96 for Z star. One is your sigma and N is 10, so we'll do square root of 10 on the bottom. And hopefully when you crunch this value out, you should have gotten values of 0.4 and 1.6. Now at the bottom of the example, the question reads, are these good evidence that the cola has lost its sweetness in storage? And we say the evidence is good if the confidence interval just contains positive values. We say the evidence is not good if the interval contains zero because this would suggest that it is possible that there's no change. So based on your answer to number one, is there good evidence that cola has lost its sweetness? Well, I don't see zero in this interval, so this seems to be pretty good evidence that cola has lost its sweetness. We have two values here that make up our 95% confidence interval. We're 95% sure that the sweetness loss is between 0.4 and 1.6, which are both positive values. So that seems pretty, pretty good likelihood that cola has lost its sweetness. Now there's another way of answering the same question, and this is by performing what's called a significance test. A significance test helps us analyze the data and determine if an alternative hypothesis should be used instead of a null hypothesis. So let's review these things about hypotheses. We had said that when you're making a guess as to what you think is going to happen, is there good evidence that cola has lost its sweetness? The null hypothesis means no change has occurred, no difference from usual. No, cola hasn't changed. The null hypothesis I call the no hypothesis. The abbreviation we use for the null hypothesis, because this is a lot of letters to spell out here, we do a capital H for hypothesis and then we do a subscript of zero to represent the null hypothesis. Now the null hypothesis means no change, no difference. For example, what you could say is you could say the null hypothesis, h sub zero, we do a little colon here to say here's what it is. We could say in this case that the null hypothesis is that the mean change in cola, mu, is equal to zero. There is no change in sweetness. The other thing that you could say is that it wouldn't be wrong to say that mu is less than or equal to zero, which means that cola hasn't lost its sweetness. In fact, it may have gained sweetness. So a negative value would mean that cola has gained sweetness. The alternative hypothesis is sort of like the yes hypothesis. Yes, a change has occurred. Yes, there's a difference in sweetness. The alternative hypothesis is abbreviated with an H for hypothesis, and then a capital, or lowercase, excuse me, a lowercase a for alternative. Don't call this ho and ha, it's h sub zero, h sub a. In this example, is there evidence cola has lost its sweetness? The alternative hypothesis would be h sub a, colon, mu is greater than zero there is a sweetness loss. It's bigger than zero when you subtract these values. When you're working with the null hypothesis, the null hypothesis will always have an equal sign in the statement. So it'll always have either an equal sign, a less than or equal to, or a greater than or equal to. Whereas in your alternative hypothesis, you will always have some sort of inequality without the equal sign. So be ready for a less than, a greater than, or not equal to symbol. 
If there is a change, it's different from what the usual value is. Now we have you turn to page 567. You're going to read examples 1029 and 1031 in your book. The answers to these problems are found in the back of your book on page S29. I'd like you to read the problems. I'd like you to write down the answers for these by copying from the back of the book. And we'll talk about what these results mean in just a moment. So we're going to pause the video and we'll have you finish these two problems. We'll give you a couple minutes to do that. So when we look at our answer in 1029, you'll notice in the alternative hypothesis we've used this not equal to symbol. The problem says whether the mean diameter has moved away from target. So moved away means it could be less than, it could be greater than. If we aren't sure based on the question, we're just going to write not equal to. We don't do like mu is less than 5 or greater than 5. We just use a not equal to symbol. In 1031, however, the professor suspects that the students have a lower mean score. This would mean in the alternative hypothesis, my guess is the scores are lower than 50, so we do mu is less than 50. In general, in your, in your null hypothesis, look for an equal sign. In your alternative hypotheses, read the question. That will give you an indication what you should use for your symbols. Using the same idea, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to answer problems 1030 and 1032 using the same idea. We'll pause the video for a couple minutes and give you a chance to answer those questions as well. On problem 1030, our null hypothesis is the idea that no change has occurred, that the mean income is still 42,500. However, when you read the question, the alternative hypothesis, another guess would be that the salaries or the mean incomes have increased. They're higher than the general population. So because it says higher, we'll use a greater than inequality for that one. In 1032, we suspect that our mean is equal to 2.6. That's the average service hour. Assuming no changes occurred, it's still going to be 2.6. However, this year's data may show a different average. So if it's different, we're not going to say less than or greater than. It doesn't specify a direction. So again, we're going to use the not equal to inequality for that one. So let's go back to the question from example 10.9 on page 560. Are these data good evidence that COLA has lost sweetness in storage? We're going to answer this question directly by setting up what's called a significance test. And there are a few main components to setting up a significance test. Component number one, write out the null and alternative hypotheses that could answer the question. So if somebody says, are there good evidence that, is there good evidence that coal has lost its sweetness? You could say, no, not really. I think that the mean change is still zero. Or you could say, yeah. I think there has. The yes hypothesis is yes, COLA has lost sweetness. So these means we should get of these differences should be greater than zero. So the first step you do in a significance test problem is write out what the possible hypotheses are going to be. Component two, calculate the test statistic. We're going to find out where our data falls on a bell curve, assuming the status quo, the null hypothesis is true. This value is called a z-score and uses a formula similar to the one we learned about in chapter 9. We're going to use the formula below to find the z-score, for example, 10.9, and graph it as a vertical segment on a scaled bell curve. So here's our formula for z. Now usually when we calculate z, we take a value minus a mean and divide it by a standard deviation. In this problem, mu sub 0 is the mean that's listed in the null hypothesis. So for our example, to calculate what z is equal to, we're going to take our sample mean, which we already calculated earlier. That was 1.02. We're going to subtract mu sub 0, the mu that was given in the null hypothesis. In the null hypothesis, the mean was 0. So I'm going to write down the mean that I listed in the null hypothesis. Divided by sigma, we already said in this problem, was 1. And n is your sample size, which was 10. So sigma and n we also had in our confidence interval formula here. So we're picking out three of the values we used in our confidence interval problem from earlier. When you crunch this out in your calculator, I would suggest putting this entire denominator inside a set of parentheses. It's not written in the formula, but if you are typing this in your calculator, you probably want to make sure that you're coming up with the right value. 
The value you should get, again, we're gonna round this to the hundredths place, is 3.23, and I'd say check this out in your calculator to make sure you're getting the same value, because you don't wanna go home later tonight not knowing how to do this problem correctly. I said we're also gonna graph this using a vertical segment on a scaled bell curve, so similar to what we've done in step five in the past, we're gonna do our one, two, three, one, two, three on each side. 3.23 is over here on this side. And what we're actually going to shade is we're going to shade to the right. And you might be going, why are we shading to the right? In step three, we're calculating the p-value. Now the p-value is the probability of getting data as extreme or more extreme than our result if the null hypothesis is actually true. So we got a value that was as extreme as 3.23 tick marks away. What I'm looking for are values that are that extreme or more extreme. So we're gonna shade even farther to the right. And what it says here is, so what we'll do is we'll shade the region of the bell curve from the vertical line we drew toward the nearest tail because that's gonna be more extreme. And we'll find the proportion of the region that is shaded. Redraw the bell curve below with the vertical segment, show the shading, and calculate the proportion of the shaded region. Okay. I don't think we need to redraw the bell curve. We've kind of shown it here already. We've shown our shading, and the proportion we're looking for is the probability that Z is greater than 3.23. Now, if you're also wondering why is it greater than, it's going to show us the more extreme values, but here's a quick hint from me to you. It also ties in with this inequality here. So if it's a greater than here, it's going to be a greater than here as well. The probability that Z is greater than 3.23 if you go to your tables is going to be 1 minus 0 0.9994, which equals 0 0.0006. This value is called the P value. Okay, great. What does P value mean? Here's what p-value is getting at. You may recall in our last unit that we used 95% a lot for confidence intervals. Most of the time when we calculate a confidence interval, it seemed like we always used 95%. Now where does the other 5% come in? The remaining 5% comes in play here. We typically say if the p-value is less than 5%, this is a significant event. So something that occurs less than 5% of the time is unusual. We consider that to be significant. In this example, we call alpha equals 5% the significance level. So the abbreviation for significance is, is alpha. It's not necessary to use 0.05, you could also use 0.01, similar to confidence intervals. You could use 95%, you could use 99%. A p-value of less than 0.05 is so unlikely that it should cause us to doubt that the null hypothesis is true. So let me say that one more time. If you get a p-value that's small, that should kind of have us draw some red flags to go, hmm, something is kind of suspicious here. I don't think the null hypothesis would be true if we're getting a p-value that's this small. So here's what we usually say. If the p-value is less than 0.05, or some other pre-established significance level, but usually 0.05 is what we use, it's a significant event and we reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is small, we reject the null hypothesis. Think of small things that get rejected, like the runt of a litter, you know, litter of, of kitties. Okay, oh, that's a small kitty. The mother kind of disregards it, small. Okay, man proposes to the woman with a diamond ring. Oh, that's not even one carat? Mm, no thanks. Small values were rejecting. If the p-value is greater than 0.05, this is not a significant event, and we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Remember, we don't say we accept the null hypothesis. It's always we fail to reject. So how should we evaluate the p-value here? Here's what we'd say. Since the p-value is less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis, H sub O, and we say there is significant evidence that if we're rejecting the null hypothesis, it looks like the alternative is true, and the alternative is that mu is greater than zero.